Good evening. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Kwame Anthony Appiah of New York University, the distinguished philosopher and cultural theorist. This is the first IC MoMA talk, an inaugural lecture series in a new series sponsored by the International Council as part of its annual fall meeting. And I want to thank especially those at the International Council who've had the foresight to think about providing a forum, a context, in which to learn from some of the most interesting thinkers around. And I also want to acknowledge the role of Carol Coffin and Jay Levinson in making this evening possible. We are live streaming tonight, so for those of you uh, who want to catch this later, you can go back to our website and pick it up, and there'll be an international audience watching throughout the evening. This series continues actually an old tradition of the councils in addressing issues of broad cultural interest, going back to a major speech on international exchange in the arts delivered before the council in 1955 by the American diplomat George Keenan. I'm thrilled that we have Professor Pia tonight because he brings a unique international perspective to his subject. He's the son of a Ghanaian father, a lawyer, diplomat, and politician, and an English mother, an art historian and writer. He was educated in Cambridge and has taught in this country at Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Cornell, and Duke. In 2011, he received the National Humanities Medal from President Obama. He has written more than a dozen books, ranging from studies of African identity, like In My Father's House, to key works of philosophy, such as Cosmopolitanism, a book that has profoundly influenced, I think, a whole generation of thinkers and art historians who've struggled to figure out how to place art and culture in a global context. He also provides the New York Times readers with very practical analyses of personal dilemmas in The Ethicist, a column in the Sunday Magazine. Tonight, he will be speaking to us on art and identity, a subject that crosses the borders of traditional disciplines and one to which he has given a great deal of thought and consideration. Please welcome Professor Apia. Um, thanks very much, Glenn. Um, thank you for this kind invitation. I look forward to uh, discussing these thoughts with you um, uh, once I've uh, done. I think I'm going to put my glasses back on. <laughs> so I assume that you, like me, love art museums. Otherwise, why would you be here? So here, I suggest, is one reason why. They allow us both to learn about traditions we identify with, our own arts, so to speak, and to explore the arts and cultures of others. I love visiting the museums in Kumasi, the town where I grew up, which are largely, in some sense, about us, the people of Asante, whose capital Kumasi is, and contain some of the magnificent things that we have made. But I have taken great pleasure as well, obviously, in the experience of going to the great museums on the Museum Insel in Berlin, around Trafalgar Square in London, or to the MoMA and the Met, and the Louvre or the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, here seen as I first saw it when young. <laughs> All of these are places where I can appreciate and learn about and bask in the beauty or the power or the challenge of the arts of civilizations with which I don't have that kind of connection of a local identity. So here, just to give you a sense of that, some are at random, somewhat at random are what uh, Mary Poppins would have called a few of my favorite things. Temple of Dendo here in New York, Giorgione's Three Philosophers in uh, Vienna, the Pergamon, altar in, on the Museum Insel. Because one of the key things about these great museums is that they allow us to take pleasures in cultures, as I say, with which we don't have 
the connection of identity. They permit us to engage with cultures to which our connection is, in some sense, just our connection as human beings. I like to think of the museum as a place in which you can see, say, a Chinese artifact like this Ming vase, not being Chinese yourself, and think of it as for the moment yours, transcending the normal divisions of identity that play such a large role in the way people currently think about the arts and about culture. Uh, this one is also in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York as is, by the way, the linguist stick from Asante that I showed you earlier, which isn't actually in a museum in Kumasi. And, oh, uh, here's uh, one more thing that I rather like, which happens to be in your collection here. So I'm honored to have been asked to speak to an audience knowledgeable about art and museums, but I want to be clear at the start that I'm no expert myself in that field. I want to share with you some thoughts about the ways in which issues of identity are evoked whenever we approach the arts. And on that topic, I am, like anyone who ever goes to a museum, an expert, because I have had things evoked in me every time I've been to one of those places that I showed you and to a score of other museums, of course, uh, that I've experienced in the course of a long lifetime of museum going. After all, so for example, I've often found myself looking for an African presence in the museums I mentioned and in others. Some years ago in Sao Paulo, for example, I found myself in an Afro-Brazilian museum with its eerie evocation of the slave ships that brought Africa to Brazil. This is a wonderful room where you have the remains of a slave ship. Now, my presence there had something to do with my own African origins, of course, though the Brazilians who commended it to me clearly think of it as a great reflection of their national identity and the deep interconnections between Brazilian culture and the African cultures from which so many of the ancestors of Brazil's people came. It was mine then as an African, and it was theirs as Brazilians. And I could enjoy it in good measure, of course, because since I am not Brazilian, it was teaching me about worlds I did not know. Today, I'd like to explore briefly with you some of the difficulties that we now have in our thinking about culture and identity that go back, or so I'm going to argue, to theories that developed in the 18th and 19th centuries in Europe and North America about the time the modern idea of the museum was actually taking off. I want to say a little bit about some of those ideas and what I think is good and bad in them, and what in particular I think we may have lost in some of recent ways of framing the issues. That we're in a bit of a muddle today is less surprising when you remember that our ideas come out of an intellectual history that is itself full of conflict and contest. Some of our contemporary ideas about the value of science and reason and the importance of truth, these are clearly not shared by absolutely everybody in the present, but some of our ideas about the value of science and reason and the importance of truth, about the centrality of beauty or sublimity in aesthetic experience, about the importance of human dignity and human rights and of toleration in politics, some of these ideas come from the Enlightenment. But many of our ideas about culture and com politics come from a sort of first great reaction against the Enlightenment uh, in the form of Romanticism. And the argument between Enlightenment and Romantic ideas, I think, is still with us, though we don't always recognize that that's what's going on. The idea of the artistic genius, for example, which is part of the way many people still respond to the arts, uh, whether we think reflectively it's a good idea or not, that certainly comes from Romanticism. So does the idea that emotion rather than reason is the key to our response to the arts. Less often noticed, though, is that a new set of ideas about identity and about national identity in particular, which come from Romanticism, are also with us. In these, a connection is made between the idea, between the nation, the idea of the nation on the one hand, and artistic genius on the other. Indeed, the modern idea of the artistic genius grows together with the idea of national genius, because the individual genius is an expression of the genius of his or her nation. For the great uh, German philosopher, Johann Gottfried Herder, 
who's the godfather in many ways of German Romanticism and of the so-called Sturm und Drang, the movement that created the literature in which modern German culture finds its origins, for Herder, the German nation is not essentially a political institution. It's not defined by geography. It's not a group defined biologically by shared descent. It is essentially a spiritual thing. A nation is defined by its geist, its spirit. The geist of a nation, the Volksgeist, is the core meaning of the nation. And the geist of the nation is found most profoundly expressed in the national language and in the arts, in culture. And so the genius of Goethe and Helderlin, for example, but also the genius of the common folk whose stories the Brothers Grimm collected as expressions of German folk culture, uh, all of these are expressions of the national spirit of the German Volksgeist, a spirit which in the case of the literary arts is not just a Volksgeist, but a Sprachgeist, a spirit embedded not just in the nation's intellectual life in general, but more particularly in language. For the modern romantic nationalists, this is what a nation really is, the embodiment and expression of a Geist, something spiritual, intellectual, psychical. That's why nations matter, and that's why individual creativity matters, because individual creativity is the means through which a national creativity is expressed. Nobody believes that now, right? So why did the Guggenheim have a show a decade ago about Spanish art from El Greco, yup, that means the Greek, to Picasso, who lived most of his life in France? Perhaps you don't recall exactly the catalog of the show, but before you see the catalog, aren't you likely to think, well, of course, great Spanish art, expression of the soul of Spain, the soul that we hear in flamenco and see in the bullfight, the soul that Hemingway resonated with so eloquently, machismo responding to the bright colors of the Mediterranean sun. Stop me now. I could go on like this for a while. But I don't have to. The Guggenheim itself talks about radical juxtapositions that cross across time to reveal the overwhelming coherence of the Spanish tradition. We're all familiar, in other words, with this sort of talk. So let me underline the problem by asking you to focus on why a late 16th, early 17th century, whose name was Domenicos Theotokopoulos, a man from Crete trained in Venice, who was known as the Greek, should be thought of as an embodiment of something essentially Spanish. I'm teasing the curators of this show not because they've made what I think is a mistake here. I'm teasing them because it makes, it's a mistake that tempts most of us when we start thinking about art. And I'm urging you to think of that as a consequence of our being heirs to some of these romantic ideas about the arts. And so my claim is, if you want to understand why it is so natural to think like this, we have to go back to romantics like Herder. Now, I've made it sound so far as though Herder and his romantic friends thought that all that mattered about art was its contribution to the nation. So you might think I'm going to assign to them the responsibility, not just for the theory that all art is national, which I do, but also for the idea that we should focus only on art that is from our own nation. But that is far from the truth. Because at the very same moment, and alongside this way of understanding art and culture as the expression of a national spirit, at the very same time, modern cosmopolitanism develops. And Herder is one of the godparents of cosmopolitanism as well as modern cosmopolitanism, as well as one of the godparents of modern nationalism. But just take, for example, this fellow, uh, George Gordon Lord Byron, one of those romantic geniuses, who died fighting for the freedom of the Greeks from Ottoman domination. Some of you will recall his verse about his adopted home, the Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, where burning Sappho loved and sung, where grew the arts of war and peace, where Delos rose and Phoebus sprung. Eternal summer gilds them yet, but all except their sun is set. But Lord Byron wasn't a Greek, he was a Scot. And the poetry of Sappho mattered to him 
not because he was Greek like Sappho, but because it was great poetry. Expressive, it is true, I suppose, of an Attic genius, but speaking to anyone who could understand the words and had never felt the slightest twinge of romantic emotion, and had ever felt the slightest twinge of romantic emotion. The point is that romantics like Byron, like Herder, not only celebrated their own Volksgeist, they also celebrated the spirits of other folks. Herder's nationalism was deeply cosmopolitan. And the very idea of cosmopolitan nationalism, which strikes the modern ear as a contradiction in terms, is crucial to understanding what's good about this tradition, I think. And that, of course, is the thought that even if you do think of art as the product of nations rather than individuals, you also value the art that's produced by nations other than your own. Herder and Byron shared the sentiment that I said that I feel in the great cosmopolitan museums, which is, here am I responding to these objects, which are mine as human, not as Ghanaian or American or whatever I'm currently thinking of myself as being. That excitement about the variety of human cultural artifacts is one of the two key elements of the tradition of cosmopolitanism, which stretches back to the cynics of the fourth century who first coined the expression cosmopolites, citizen of the world. Cosmopolitanism starts with that metaphor of universal citizenship. We are members one of another, as St. Paul says in Ephesians. But a second, equally important element offers a sort of commentary on what it takes to be a moral community. Because cosmopolitans think that we can accept responsibility for one another while still living very different lives. In fact, cosmopolitans revel in the range and variety of the ways people live and of the things they make and do. And so unlike many people who think of the world as a moral community, cosmopolitans don't want to change everyone else to fit to our own mold. Uh, we, I, I might as well admit that I count myself among the cosmopolitans, we are interested in human, social, cultural, and individual variety. So you might expect cosmopolitans to side with those who are busy around the world preserving culture and resisting cultural imperialism and salvaging cultural patrimony. But behind these slogans, I think you find very often some puzzling assumptions. Take preserving culture. It's one thing to provide people with help to sustain arts that they want to sustain. Long live the Ghana National Cultural Center in Kumasi, whose entrance I showed you earlier, where you can go and learn traditional Akan dancing and drumming, especially when its classes are spirited and overflowing. Restore the deteriorating film stock of early Hollywood movies. Continue the preservation of old Norse and early Chinese and Ethiopian manuscripts. Record, transcribe, and analyze the oral traditions of Malay and Maasai and Maori. All these are valuable parts of our human heritage. But preserving culture in the sense of cultural artifacts, broadly conceived, is different from preserving cultures. And the preservationists of cultures often pursue the latter, trying to ensure, for example, that the, the Huli of Papua New Guinea keep their authentic ways. And who wouldn't want people to keep these authentic ways? Who wouldn't want to know that in the world there was a culture where the guys put this on when they want to celebrate? But what makes a cultural expression authentic? Should we stop importing baseball caps into Vietnam so that the Zhao will continue with their colorful red headdresses? Well, maybe we should ask them. Shouldn't the choice be theirs if they want to wear baseball caps? Why shouldn't they? They have no real choice, the cultural preservationists say. We have dumped cheap Western clothes into their markets and they can no longer afford the silk they used to wear. If they had what they really wanted, they'd still be dressed traditionally. But that's, that's no longer an argument about authenticity. The claim is that they can't afford to do something that they'd really like to do, something that's expressive of an identity they care about and want to sustain. That's a genuine problem. It's one that afflicts people in many communities. They're too poor to live the life they want to lead. If that's true, it's an argument for seeing whether we can alleviate their poverty. But if they get richer and they still want to run around in baseball caps and t-shirts, that's their choice. Talk of authenticity 
now just amounts to telling other people what they ought to value in their own traditions. That's one of the intellectual risks that comes with the idea of the Volksgeist. Once you think of the folk as having a common spiritual core, you can be tempted by the thought that people ought to be faithful to the Geist they belong to. You ought to stick with the Geist you came in with. That way lies what we now call essentialism, the practice of treating people of some identity as having some core set of norms they ought to live up to because they have that identity. If all great art made by Germans expresses the German genius, indeed, if that is one of the criteria for great German art, then art that's un-German can't be great, unless, of course, it's made by someone un-German. In the real world, we don't often have to tell people that they ought to wear the authentic dress of their folk. People who can afford it most like to put on traditional garb, at least from time to time. I was best man once at a Scottish wedding where the bridegroom wore a kilt and I wore kente cloth, which is how Asante men dress on festive occasions. Uh, Andrew Oronse, who piped us up the aisle with his bagpipes, whispered in my ear at one point, here we all are then, in our tribal gear. In Kumasi, people who can afford them love to put on their kente, especially the most traditional ones, woven in colorful silk strips in the town of Bonwiri, as they have been for many centuries. One reason we don't often have to tell people where the dress of the folk is because the romantic nationalist ideology has traveled all around the planet. There are many languages that have taken up with the idea of our culture. And if you want evidence that it's something new, here's one piece of evidence. There are lots of languages, my father's language is among them, in which the very word for culture is an import. In our case, my father's language, the word for culture is one you will recognize. It's kocha. A while ago, I was walking with an old friend of mine who works as a linguist in the palace of the Queen Mother of Asante. We were walking across the palace gardens to a traditional ceremony, and I asked him why the ceremony mattered, and he said, e ye ye kocha. It is our culture. But trying to find our culture, the authentic stuff of the Volksgeist, can be like peeling an onion. The traditional garb of Herero women in Namibia derives, as you can see, from the attire of 19th century German missionaries, though of course it's still remarkably Herero, not least because the fabrics they use have a distinctly un-Lutheran range of colors. And so, too, with our kente cloth. The silk was always imported, traded by Europeans, produced in Asia. The tradition was once an innovation. Should we reject it for that region as not ours, as untraditional? How far back do you have to go? Cultures are made of continuities and changes, and the identity of a society survives through such changes. Societies without change aren't more authentic they're dead. Pious talk of the authentic is often, in any case, wonderfully misdirected. Someone once told me the story of a collector of recipes who arrived in a Cambodian village yearning for authentic local cuisine. Here's a dish, one of the locals began. You take smoked tongue of water ox. Well, if you can't get smoked water ox tongue, you can use shrimp. No, no, the visitor said. I want to follow exactly your authentic recipe. Really, said the Cambodian, we only use water ox tongue because we can't get shrimp. <laughs> Cosmopolitans don't need to endorse every appeal to cultural preservation. Preserving culture in the sense of artifacts is one thing. Preserving cultures, as I've been arguing, is quite another. Identity matters then in our responses to art, but Herder would have insisted that we keep hold as well of the other side of the cosmopolitan package, which says every object is indeed an expression of the Geist, but human beings need to share the product of their communities across boundaries. Now, I've been discussing this thought without questioning it as if I agree with it, so let me now insist that this strikes me as one of the great philosophical misunderstandings about the arts. It would probably have occurred to you already in this room that art is not made by nations or cultures. It is made by artists. It may take a lot of people to make a work of art, 
as it does to make a single performance of Beethoven's Ode to Joy. It takes a lot of people singing the right notes, a lot of musicians playing the right instruments in the right order, and blending their sounds together. But still, it's made by them, and the work that they're making, the work that they're expressing, was itself made by a person, one person in that case, a very great musician. A person who operated in an environment shaped by a local culture, but also shaped, of course, profoundly, since that person was Beethoven, by a musical culture that was not, in any sense, national alone. More than this, the way in which the national context informs art is not the way that talk of the Geist suggests. It's not because each artwork belongs together organically with the other products of the local Geist. The name for that view is organicism, and the right picture is not organicist. Every element of culture, from philosophy to cuisine to the style of bodily movement, is separable in principle from the others. You really can walk and talk like an African-American and think with Matthew Arnold and Kant, as well as with Martin Luther King and Miles Davis. There are organic holes in our cultural life. The music, the words, the set design, the dance of an opera fit and are meant to fit together. It is, in the word Wagner invented, a Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art. But there isn't one great big thing called culture that unites organically all the objects in this museum. Kafka and Miles Davis can live together as easily as Kafka and Strauss. Indeed, upon reflection, I find it more natural to think of Kafka with Miles Davis than at least with Richard Strauss. What is true in high culture is true in cuisine. Britons have swapped rice and curry for their old fish and chips. You'll find the style of hip hop in the streets of Tokyo. Spain, in the heart of the West, resisted liberal democracy for two generations after it took off in India and Japan. Jefferson's Western inheritance, Athenian liberty, and Anglo-Saxon freedom didn't preserve the United States from creating a slave republic. The truth has become more easily visible in the last century or so, since much of the art that we now most value, especially much of the art that we have seen produced in the last century, is just profoundly not national. Uh, consider this fellow caught posing for Man Ray here as one of those romantic geniuses. This is an artist who took an inspiration from a Vili figurine from the Congo, shown to him in Paris. He, of course, not being French, but as the Guggenheim insists, Spanish. Shown to him in Paris by a Frenchman, Henri Matisse, at a party at the home of an American, Gertrude Stein. And inspired by it, he helps create a new form of art which then travels the world, both in the sense that his painting is admired and appreciated in many countries and travels to many countries, but also in the sense, of course, that he provides inspiration to many people, including many contemporary African painters, especially those coming out of African art academies. That circulation is essential to the life of the kind of art we care about, the arts we care about more generally. It's essentially obviously true in literature as well. The first great history of English literature was written by a Frenchman, Hippolyte Taine. Taine had a terrible time trying to tell the history of English literature in this nationalist way because, of course, all the people you immediately think of as the geniuses of the English tradition are people who were profoundly conscious of, interacting with, and inspired by literary art from other places. This fellow, whom you recognize, uh, was inspired by Italian sonnets by this fellow, Petrarch, and by stories from Greece and Rome told by people like this fellow, who, uh, Livy, who, who was a Roman. Or consider all those wonderful Russian novelists that we so much admire, and notice how much French there is in them. Or why is Goethe's arguably greatest poetry cycle, the West Östliche Divan, um, called that because divan is a Persian word? Well, because it was inspired by the 14th century Persian poet Hafiz, uh, whose tomb is still a place of cultural per per uh, pilgrimage for Iranians. 
for Persians. There are reasons, in short, for skepticism about the idea that culture, or at any rate the stuff we rightly care about most, is national in any deep sense. I leave aside the difficulty that much of what we care about is ancient, and that even if it is the product of, those nation, of nations, the nations are gone. There is no Etruscan nation to think of as the proud contemporary possessors of Etruscan art. There is no king of Nock. There is no kingdom of Nock. There are no Nock people to be the possessors of these wonderful Nigerian sculptures. So if they belong to a nation, they don't belong to anyone anymore. Whereas I claim, in the spirit of cosmopolitanism, that in fact they belong to all of us. So it seems to me that the idea that all culture is national, to use a word of criticism that we favored when I was a teenager, is hopeless. It's relatively easy nowadays to make a copy of the Mona Lisa so good that merely looking at it, as you would look at the original in the Louvre, you couldn't tell the copy from the original. But only the original has what Walter Benjamin called the aura, only it has the connection with the hand of Leonardo. That's why millions of people who could have spent their plane fare on buying a great reproduction had been to the Louvre. They want the aura. It is a kind of magic. And it is the same kind of magic that nations feel towards their history. One of the many symbols that recurs regularly in a Santi iconography is a little bird with its head turned back to pick at the feathers between its wings, a figure called Sankofa, which means literally, go back and get it. There's a tree proverb that says, Ututchuni na usankofa yenchri. If you throw something away and you go back and take it, that's not taboo. The proverb, which you hear often, can be used to say that it's good to retrieve what you need from the past. And we all understand that feeling. The connection people feel to cultural objects that are symbolically theirs because they were produced from within a world of meaning created by their ancestors. That's the connection of art to identity. It's powerful. It should be acknowledged. The cosmopolitan in me, however, wants to remind us of other connections. So one connection is the connection not through identity, but despite difference. We can respond to art that is not ours, indeed, in the end, we can only fully respond to our art if we move beyond thinking of it as ours and start responding to it as art. But equally important is the human connection. My people, human beings, made the Great Wall of China, the Chrysler Building, the Sistine Chapel. These things were made by creatures like me through the exercise of skill and imagination. I don't have those skills, and my imagination works in a different direction. Nevertheless, in a deep sense, that potential is also in me. These connections through our common humanity are made in the imagination, of course, but so are the connections that we make to our more local identities. And to say that they're imaginary isn't to say they're unreal, is to say what makes them real is the imagination. And surely our connections to these things are among the realist connections that we have. Thank you. So I think the plan is that two microphones will circulate among you, um, and you will defend the nation. Right. Want to direct us? Thank you, first of all, for a splendid lecture. As you were concluding, I immediately thought of the issue of cultural patrimony. Uh, and if we're all citizens of the world and if culture belongs to all of us, uh, to what degree is there validity in the notion of patrimony uh, 
in the various laws that surround that within the frame of cosmopolitanism? Well, as you'll anticipate, or in fact, as you know, <laughs> don't have to anticipate, um, I'm not super enthused about the way things have gone uh, in the international regulation of these matters. I'm, I'm, I'm an enemy of UNESCO uh, <laughs> in the sense that I think that, um, I think two things. One is um, we should have an international regime that guarantees that the 190 odd nations of the world all commit to protect protecting the, the important cultural objects that are under their jurisdiction because they're in their country. Um, it's, it's part of the job of the government of Afghanistan to protect Gandhara sculptures, and if it doesn't do it, it's not, it's, it's not just letting down the Afghans, it's letting all of us down, it's letting down the people of the world because they are trustees of the art that's currently under their control. So I don't have any problem with the idea that nations are a very important part of the apparatus through which we should protect the arts. But I think we should think of the nations as protecting the arts for all of us. And that means that there are reasons for wanting art to uh, be in many places because every human being, as I've been urging, every human being has something to gain from looking at art not just that's connected with them, but with art that's connected with everybody else, including all the cultures that have gone and have left no obvious heirs. Um, if that's right, then there are reasons for, uh, for creating national connections. And because, as I said, art does connect with identity, those national connections are likely to focus a little bit more on stuff from Kenya if they're in Nairobi or from Ghana if they're in Accra. But a decent national museum in Accra had better have some stuff that isn't from Ghana. Otherwise, it'll miss out on this whole other side of the experience of the arts. So. Um, now, as you know, we have now a kind of international regime that, that urges us to think that any country has a special right to limit the movement of anything that was made there. Um, and that, that idea is sort of uh, uh, supported by treating, uh, by using the metaphor of ownership by, uh, and suggesting that, na that nations <laughs> own this stuff. I think that's just the wrong metaphor. I agree that nations should take trustees' responsibility for stuff, and there are reasons why some art should be in particular places. This art is in the right place. Taking it away would diminish its significance and value, would make it less clear what it was, uh, it would disconnect it from its history. Um, that's not an argument about Italy or the Vatican owning anything, it's an argument about the proper citing of a site-specific work of art. Uh, and I'm perfectly sympathetic to arguments of that sort. But the idea that uh, it would be a terrible thing if the Vatican exchanged some of its great uh, collections for new stuff from the rest of the world, that that would somehow be betraying their role as the owners of some patrimony, I think that's just a mistake. They would be enriching the cultural experiences available to people who visit the Vatican. So I think we've sort of gotten, and you know, that's just to make a theoretical objection, as it were. The practical objection, speaking as someone who's been to the uh, National Art Museum in Ghana recently, is that um, Ghana doesn't have the resources to look after those things properly right now. So it's more preoccupied with building roads and feeding people. And actually, the best place to see a can art right now is, is in Texas and in London. Uh, and I'm, I mean, frankly, as someone from Kumasi, I'm glad the people in Texas can see how terrific our stuff is. I'm glad that the millions of visitors who pass through the British Museum or the Wallace Collection or whatever see these things. I think that's great. So I'm, I'm sort of unsympathetic to the general thrust of this, but after all, what's happened is essentially what you would expect to happen if you put a lot of lawyers representing governments in a room together. And we should have had more art lovers in the conversation. Not that some of the uh, lawyers don't love art, but I, mean, but I think that the thrust of it should have been very different. The thrust of it should be thinking about, not about ownership, but about access, about making sure that the widest range of artistic experience is available to the widest range of people. And having a bunch of things that say that if anything you know, was made in Mexico, uh, 
the Mexican government can say it should never leave, that doesn't help circulate. It doesn't help the Mexicans, right? Because the one thing the Mexicans are not short of is Mexican art. Short of. I mean, and, and ditto for the Italians. The Italians, Italians are not short of Italian art. Um, so, if 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 when people argue that they want, <coughs> so a whole bunch of stuff from my hometown was was taken um, by a man called Sir Garnet Woolsey uh, after a battle in the late 19th century, yeah. and a lot of it's at Windsor, but somehow ended up in the hands of the royal family. And they've sent some of it back. Um, I think that's fine because some of what they sent back uh, allows us to fill out in Kumasi the collections that relate to our history in a way that um, is important to us and less important to other people. But I don't want everything to come back. I'm happy to have some of the things there because otherwise most people aren't going to go to Kumasi and most people, if, if most people don't go to Kumasi, they won't know, they won't, they won't ever get to interact you know, with things like that. <laughs> Uh, and I'm glad things like that circulate widely, and I'm glad the government of Ghana doesn't say, oh, that's a very fine Sankofa, uh, it's in London, we're going to file suit to bring it home. I have a question. Yes. Uh, does the artist really represent the culture, or does what the artist create when he's a real artist exist as a prototype? And as a prototype, it is not immediately understood. And when it is understood, that's to say it is absorbed within the society, and society operates in a semantic domain, then the prototype becomes a type. And with time, the type will become a stereotype. Now, therefore, it is always the individual that makes the culture, not the culture that is helping to be represented. As a, first comes the artist, then comes the culture. Of course, it's my position. <laughs> well, I think it's, I mean, I, I, I'm sympathetic to the thought that, um, as, as, I, as I said, that we should think of art as made by artists. Uh, um, but, of course, they use, as you said, semantic resources made available uh, by the culture in the sense of the, the language and traditions within which they operate. And so, uh, absent a culture, um, they wouldn't be able to do anything because it's because they have a culture that they have a language and so on. Um, but yes, I think um, more than that, uh, very often when an artwork is, um, when a new kind of art is first created, among the first people to grasp its importance, turn out, it turns out, are often people somewhere else. Um, some of the first appreciators of Montaigne's essays, and Montaigne invented the essay, uh, I mean, he was the first person to use the word essay to talk about a kind of writing. Some of the first appreciators of that were in England, and Bacon's essays, which occur not long afterwards, wouldn't have existed if Florio's translation of Montaigne hadn't arrived in England pretty quickly. So, uh, though actually I think Bacon wrote it in French. So, um, uh, the idea that the, um, the, the, the community that provides the resources to the person who's making the art is the only community that's going to help in the interpretation or the, uh, that's just historically un ungrounded way of thinking. And to repeat the point that I tried to use Shakespeare and Goethe to exemplify, a lot of the art we most care about was produced by people who found themselves stimulated across national and linguistic and religious and cultural boundaries. And that, of course, is overwhelmingly true in the present. Um, it's, it's, uh, the people who... Uh, uh, El Anatsui, a wonderful contemporary art maker, uh, uh, was born in eastern Ghana, went to, went to art school actually in my hometown, and has taught in Nigeria all his life though he's had fellowships in various places around the world. And his, you know, the two pieces of work of his in the, in, the, um, in the Met 
are in respectively a contemporary art collection and an African collection, and that's perfectly appropriate because he's both a contemporary artist and an African artist. Um, but he is someone whose world of reference is um, evidently global. The people who taught in the art school that he went to, because um, I went to primary school on that campus, I knew some of them, uh, were Russian and English and German and American and people from other parts of Africa. And they taught by thinking about modern art, and that didn't mean that didn't mean just stuff that was made in Ghana or in West Africa or in Africa. It meant art from all over the place. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Yes, I, I really enjoyed the lecture, although I did find it very unromantic in every way. <laughs> um, uh, I, you know, I, maybe I have a very different perspective on this because I work in an industry, namely films, where I know how cultural presence is created. Um, and that it really is a question of financial resources. And I mean, I don't think that even the most national, you know, romantic, protectionist, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, politician would ever argue that, you know, the best of art should not circulate freely around the world and that Goethe shouldn't be free to be inspired by Virgil and Picasso by, by tribal art. Um, but I think that the reason for a certain level of national cultural protectionism which exists in the world is that it's not the best uh, it is what pays the most uh, that gets seen around the world and can wreck things. It's not because people want baseball hats because uh, instead of their national garb, it's because it's the cheapest thing that they can buy for a few cents. And that's why it's present. And I have found that, you know, where, where countries have been a little careful about preserving their identity, I think it can actually lead to a peaceful togetherness. I mean, I, I visited a country a few years ago, Bhutan, a little kingdom uh, where they even measure their, not their gross, gross domestic product, but their gross domestic happiness. And um, one of the things that is fostered by their very benign king is to create a sense of cultural togetherness by exactly the kind of protectionism that you talk about. It was ordained that um, people should be wearing the national dress, um, you know, not when they're at home, they can do whatever they want, but when they're outside on official things. And it's something which at first people were grumbling about, which actually helped them grow together as a country. And, um, you know, another example where I see that, I just came back from China a few days ago. Now, China has undergone radical cultural change, and in my industry, in films, it's very difficult if you've missed, uh, you know, 50 years of filmmaking to be able to create films. But, you know, I think that art also has um, a pragmatic purpose, that is to tell the stories of a group, to help a country um, heal its wounds. You know, I don't know, let's say in America, the, the, you know, the, there are different topics that are specifically relevant to this country. Um, and, you know, where uh, certain racial divides have to be bridged and healed or, you know, many other things. You know, in, in, in Germany, we certainly have our share of, of own um, problems that, that are more relevant to us. So, so I think uh, art does have a certain national effect. And, and, uh, and in China, for example, they now have a regulation where they say only a certain number of, of films from other countries can be shown in the theaters. Well, I mean, there's an outcry um, all over the world. How can this be? This is uh, incredible protectionism. But it has allowed, over the past 20 years, in, sp in spite of great resistance, paid and funded greatly by Hollywood and, you know, the, and, and um, uh, to try and augment that number, it has allowed them to grow a truly wonderful um, uh, uh, film culture, which is growing ever stronger because of exactly this kind of cultural protectionism uh, that, that you spoke against. So, I mean, I just wanted to add that as a thing and, and hear what you have to say about that. Um, well, I think I'm, I'm not going to respond about Bhutan because I think Bhutan's a very peculiar case. And um, I honestly, uh, I, I'm not, I mean, I know there's a lot of happiness in Bhutan and so on, but it's it's achieved by mechanisms that I don't think a decent uh, believer in liberal individuality, which is what I am, uh, can endorse. I, I, don't, I think it's inappropriate for a government to be telling people exactly what they should wear on the street. I think people have the right to, to make their own decisions about that kind of thing. But, um, so, but I am happy to talk about um, the role of governments in sustaining arts that address questions that a national community is interested in. So, I don't, um, I, I said that there are kinds of art that, I, that I'm glad that the, the National Center, the, the National Art Center exists in my hometown, 
uh, and I'm glad that it's po that, and I know that people relate to the arts in different ways depending on their identities. I know that some people relate to art through identity, and I'm I wasn't I said I do that myself, and I wasn't criticizing myself. I think that's a fine thing to do. Um, so I don't have any any objection to that. Uh, Well, uh, but, but I, as I say, because I'm this boring kind of liberal, uh, I don't think it's myself appropriate for the government to be dis making these decisions for everybody. The, the proper role of the government is in support of the arts in those cases. I, I, I would prefer uh, them to do it by, uh, as, as the Ministry of Culture does in Ghana and as the, no doubt the Ministry of Culture does in China, uh, but I'm not allowed to go to China because I criticize their government and they won't give me a visa. And that's a reflection of the kind of illiberalism that I think um, is manifest in the arts, but also more widely in that civilization in a way that I, I can't endorse. But I can endorse the aim of sustaining a vibrant national film culture, a vibrant uh, culture in all the arts. And there are ways for governments to do that that seem to me not illiberal, Right. Well, I, but I respectfully don't agree with that uh, because I think the Chinese government has a lot of money and one of the things it can do is uh, subsidize things and the way you compete with powerful corporate forces is by having uh, effective subsidies for things that will then be appreciated by people. You can't force the Chinese to love Chinese movies. What you can do is to help Chinese uh, people make great films that Chinese people and everybody else will want to watch. Um, so I'm, I'm against these sort of coercive ways of doing it where you, you, you limit the flows of one thing in order to focus on another thing. I'd rather do it through a, a, a powerful national education system that teaches the arts in the schools and the colleges and that celebrates the traditions of the country, uh, as is perfectly appropriate. I, as I said, I have, no, I have no hostility to the idea of an identification with a nation. When you're talking to people, you're talking to children, I tell you, in this case, the superhero movies will always win. You know? And that's the case for, for, for every five parts. The thing that appeals to young people while they're growing their sensibility will always win. And, and they like what is loud. It's just like you say, you know, uh, children But, uh, well, um, so, I mean, again, I, I agree that um, there's a role for uh, the education of children. I happen to think that the government isn't the right uh, place to make decisions about what children should eat in their homes or about what they should watch on their home um, televisions. That's a, that's, there's a role there for parents, of course, uh, and schools, but, uh, but I don't think that um, banning um, ice cream uh, and prohibiting families from allowing their children to have ice cream uh, or uh, rationing the amount of ice cream that you may give to your children, I, because I'm this boring kind of liberal, I don't think, I don't gonna, think that's the right way to do it. I'm going to jump in. Um, Anthony, the question that I was wondering about as you were speaking is that, of course, art isn't just physical objects, that things are culturally significant because of the kinds of stories we tell about them, and that our role in museums is not just as a keeper of things, but as a teller of stories. And that seems to me to be the moment where the cosmopolitan model either flourishes or breaks down. I mean, what happens when you show an object from a different culture in an institution that is um, that it doesn't come from, and then the stories can either be ones that strip it of original meaning or um, play out a set of power politics that um, that 
doesn't give true voice to a physical object. So what are the ethics of the stories around objects from other cultures that we tell, or does it not matter? Any, it can mean anything to anyone. Um, um, well, I think the question of, of uh, you know, can it mean anything to anyone, that's, that's a sort of general question about, uh, about the interpretation of the arts. My own view is that uh, the function of curation and interpretation is constrained by a number of things. One is that you shouldn't say things that aren't so. Uh, and very often people say things about things that aren't so, and that's, that's kind of, that's the basic ethical bottom line, is you should be, whatever you want to say about an object, start by doing the proper research and figure out as, well, as best you can what the truths are on the topic that you want to, you want to uh, the story you want to tell around, around the object. Um, but beyond that, the, the thing about art objects is that they are, um, inexhaustibly interpretable. There's not a list of things that such that once you've said those things, you've said everything you can say about this object. The world, this object can be related to almost any other object in the world by a sufficiently plausible story. Uh, as I say, it should be constrained by truth. The story has to be true or true-ish. Um, but, um, uh, and I think that you can tell stories that stress the connections between objects across societies, or that tell a story that's a sort of, you know, um, Spanish art story about them. Uh, the, the Spanish art story might be true, that is, it might be true that, that, there's a, that everything you say when you put together a bunch of Spanish artists over time, that everything you say is true, though I don't think it's likely to be true that there, in fact, that there is an overwhelming coherence to something called the Spanish tradition. That's just my view about Spain. Uh, and in fact, it's my view about all modern nations, that they are plural, complex, multiple. The art of Spain, after all, includes a great deal of material that was created during the period of Al-Andalus. And that's different from some of the material that's created in the Christian context. So, um, so I'm in favor of telling the truth and I'm in favor of recognizing that there's an infinite number of truths you might tell. Every, every show puts together a particular constellation of objects, relates them on the basis of some story or other, and as long as the story is a, is a properly researched true story, and an interesting one, um, go for it. Um, uh, forgive me if I'm misunderstanding a nuance of your um, if I'm misunderstanding a, hello, um, a nuance of your presentation, um, but if culture or, or cultures are um, both collective and communal um, and perhaps collectively owned, um, we are at this interesting moment, um, particularly as someone who works in media, um, where there's a, a challenge or a great concern over the question of cultural appropriation. Um, particularly, and you've spoken about culture being owned or affiliated by a certain nation, um, but is it, you know, if certain cultures are, if not owned, then affiliated by certain identities, um, at a moment where an empowered group um, is appropriating a culture and in many cases even commercializing it from a group that is um, not so empowered. I'm curious what that means for your vision of, of culture being uh, collective. Good. So um, I don't, I mean, as you'll anticipate, I don't actually uh, think that the language of cultural appropriation is the right language to criticize the things that are being criticized under that label. There are lots of things you can do that are wrong. You can exploit people. You can steal objects from them. Uh, you can uh, 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 fail to respect laws governing intellectual property. These are all things that are problematic. But um, I don't believe it's... And you can take an object that has a meaning for one lot of people and treat it in a way that's disrespectful to those people. All of those things are wrong. Uh, but they're not wrong because what you're doing is taking culture from one place and using it somewhere else. I believe that's never wrong if it's done respectfully and in ways that respect uh, 
normal property rights and uh, reasonable intellectual property regimes. And the sort of talk of cultural appropriation that you're talking about in the present seems to be inconsistent with the norms I just, I just said. It, it involves supposing that because a group has a, uh, usually what it involves is supposing that because some group has an, uh, an ex historic experience of disadvantage, we should uh, allow them control over the meaning of every artifact that's associated with their identity. I don't think you can grant people that right. I think that you can insist that we treat people, especially people who've been historically disadvantaged, respectfully. I don't object to that thought. But I don't think that the thought that um, if there's something wrong with what Paul Simon did when he took the Mbakamba music from, from South Africa and put it into Graceland, it's not that he took something from a South African culture and brought it to us. It's that he didn't pay somebody properly, or he exploited somebody, or he was disrespectful to somebody. I'm not saying any of those things is true. I'm just saying that that would be how I would conduct uh, a critique. But the mere fact of taking um, the West Ursicher Divan is cultural appropriation. Coriolanus is cultural appropriation. And I'm in favor of the West Ursicher Divan, and I'm in favor of Coriolanus. Please Sorry. join me in thanking Professor Apien. Thank you. And please join us at the reception in the Gun lobby. Thank you.